Hello, welcome to Be Make Do, a Soul Makers podcast, where we talk about what it takes to pursue your calling as a culture maker with spiritual wholeness and creative freedom. I'm your host, Lisa Smith, here with my producer, Dan ABH. Hello, everyone. And we are here to encourage and hopefully inspire you to become who you are created to be, make what you are created to make, and do what you are created to do. We're really enjoying this season of the podcast and our conversation about the wise-hearted ones in the book of Exodus, looking at ways art and design shape our world and the implications for those of us working as artists of faith. Now, if you haven't had a chance yet, I invite you to go back and take a listen to some of the conversations we've been having with artists and architects and theological thinkers about why it matters, it matters that you make art and why how you make matters. This week, we've got a special episode for you. We're gonna pause the teaching material to have a conversation about community and gathering and why these things are so important. Building empowering relationships is one of the key principles for soul makers. And obviously having a community of support and a community of challenge makes a difference for everyone. But why is it important for artists specifically? Today, I'm joined by Stephen Roach to chew on these questions a little and invite you to join us in Winston-Salem, North Carolina at the end of March for the Breath and Clay Artists Gathering. You'll find me there along with Dan and some other people from the Convergence and Soulmakers community leading a workshop on curating wholeness, building a purposeful world through art along with a bunch of other great keynote sessions, performances, workshops, and just a great opportunity for you to meet other artists and creatives from around the country and around the world. So on that note, let's talk about community and gathering. Well, so Stephen Roach is a poet, musician, and founder, the creative mind behind Makers and Mystics podcast and Breath and Clay Creative Arts Gathering, which is being held in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, March 22nd to 24th. We're excited because we're planning on being there. And uh, we're just so excited that you would take some time to talk with us for the Be Make Do podcast. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to this conversation all week. Good, good. Me too. Well, I, I want to take some time to talk about the gathering and about the theme of community in general, which you're exploring on the Makers and Mystics podcast in this season. Um, but before we go there, I just wanted to kind of give a chance for you to introduce yourself to our audience and let them know a little bit about you. So what's your story? Yeah. <laughs> Who are you anyway? <laughs> How much time do you have? <laughs> uh, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. No, so... Um, yeah, I'm Stephen Roach, and I live in North Carolina. I've lived here my whole life. In fact, uh, my mom's side of the family, I tell people she was one of 15 kids, and oh, they wow. were all bluegrass musicians um, from here in North Carolina. And then my dad was also, he was actually a third generation fiddle player from the Appalachian Mountains. And so both sides of the family, uh, very musical. I grew up playing music. I toured professionally, uh, created a band called Songs of Water. We toured for a number of years. And uh, I'm still active as a film composer. I write instrumental music for different film projects, as well as a bit of a poet, I suppose, on my good days. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and just um, like to think of myself maybe as a creative instigator of sorts. I like that creative instigator. So you, I mean, you've got those deep roots that, that music is sort of, it's in your blood. <laughs> oh yeah. I, I jokingly tell people I was condemned to be a musician from the start. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't, you never had a chance. <laughs> All right. And then you mix that with this creative instigator. Yeah. I'm curious um, because we're similar in the sense that we both have this artistic background and even creative families, but then there's this other thing on top of what compels somebody to then become a convener, you know, to, to mm -hmm. then become somebody who wants to encourage other artists to do what they do. How did yeah. that come from for you? Uh, it's, it's a great question. You know, I think at one point, 
when I was touring and music was kind of the primary focus of my life, I was wondering how long touring would be a part of what mm -hmm. I did and, you know, different places that we would go, people would always begin to ask me, how did you create this sound or how did you stumble into this, this music? Because it was very experimental. I've always been an experimentalist in everything that I do, self-taught. And so I just saw, especially within the art community and then even more nuanced within the faith art community, a need to know we have freedom to explore, uh, you mm -hmm. know, questions about how can we combine our art with our own, you know, spiritual practices, things like that. And so I just saw the need there and, and something as I began to grow, that began to grow with me that I, I not only wanted to perform and to create, but I also wanted to help others to liberate that creative spark inside of them. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was all the way back in 2014. My wife, Sarah, and I uh, held the first little mini breath and clay event in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, with about 100 folks that came out uh, locally. But throughout the year, they just continued to write to us and say, are you going to do another one? Are you going to do wow. another one of these? And uh, so it just kind of grew from there. And I, I figured out you know, this is just as much a part of the DNA or the fabric of my creative self as the art that I'm making of my own, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> I, I resonate very much with that and, and started to understand the more I understood about visual art, I kind of felt like, no, I'm a like community art, you know, <laughs> artist, social practice kind of person. Like there's, there's not, it doesn't fit into the box. Mm -hmm. But that's so, I think that's just a really important thing at this time. Like that, th that's one of the things I'm excited to have you on the podcast to be able to introduce you to our little group of people so they can get connected with what you're doing. I, I, I am amazed at how many little pockets of groups of artists of faith there are, are all over the world and how disconnected we yes. all are from each other, you know, th that we don't know that that there's other people out like there's a lot of other people out there like us. And I really am wondering if if that awareness of each other is something that God is doing right now in a mm -hmm. larger movement of sort of raising up these artists to service, you know, in the culture in a more intentional yeah. way. Yeah. You mm. know, it's always beautiful for me when I stumble across another creative community uh, like yourself, like your own. Yeah. And I find that there's a resonance happening there, almost like the synchronicity or something that yeah. we've all been tapping into the same thing and we didn't realize it. Yeah. But I also, along with that, I see how so many folks just need encouragement. So many people right now yeah. just need to know that their work matters, need to know that what they're yeah. doing is not in vain. There's a higher purpose for it, you know? And uh, so I think you're right there. And that's really one of the motivators behind what we do is to kind of take that red thread and begin to needle the communities together and mm. begin to see what kind of shape and form it might take if, if, uh, you know, if one puts a thousand to flight, what will 10,000 do, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that that was one of the things that I was curious about to ask you, just thinking so much has changed over the last couple of years, understatement, right? But, you know, you- <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> just a little bit. But you've you've been convening these these gatherings for a while, but then now there just feels like there's something different about mm -hmm. convening now after all this time and so much has happened. What do you, why, maybe there's two questions. In general, why do you think it's important to gather artists together mm -hmm. in the same place? And why now? What What's different maybe from before? Yeah, such a great question. You know, before, for me, on one hand, even though there was a deep sense of calling involved with it, I think at the same time, most just a beautiful excuse to get super cool people in the same room together and see what would happen. So maybe it was a social experiment for me. Mm. <laughs> just uh, just kind of seeing what kind of collaborations would be born out of these connections yeah. if we got in the same space. But now there's a deeper purpose 
in it for me. And it's because I recognize that so much damage was really done uh, to so many people, but I would say specifically to those working in the arts and entertainment industries, those yeah. that, you know, like my own journey, uh, event planning and hosting public gatherings in the midst of a worldwide lockdown is not a very lucrative career. <laughs> let's just say it that way, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. But for me now, it's it's more than just hosting a fun event to get everybody together. There's a real element of healing involved in this. And so when you say, why now? Why is this important now? I know because even in my own life, there is an element of restoration. There is an element of redemption. There's an element of healing that I believe is part of our gathering together again. And I think that... Um, just on a societal level, we need that. We need one another. And I think, you know, for me, I differentiate between solitude and isolation. And mm. I've experienced both. Solitude is life-giving. It's nurturing to the creative spirit. Solitude is where innovative ideas are born. It's where we can find the freedom to flesh out ideas and experiment with things. So solitude is necessary for flourishing in the creative life, but isolation is detrimental. Isolation mm. is damaging because isolation pulls you away from community, whereas solitude is kind of feeling you up for community, if that makes oh, sense. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. You know, and so the reason I bring that up is because I think that many of us have been in a place of isolation and we've almost normalized digital currency in the sense of, um, you know, the way that we interact online and the way that most of our relationships are formed through this digital platform, you know, which there's nothing wrong with that. I'm, I'm grateful for it. We're having this conversation because of that technology, right. but I think because it's so normalized that we, we forget the need we have for looking another person in the eye. And I just think that gathering with other artists, other like-minded people, other seekers, other people on their own journey, I think it's important because it pulls us out of our own sort of basic selfishness in some ways. And it can pull yeah. us out of our own inverted um, self-focus. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting opportunity uh, we we thought a lot about this in in conjunction with being a community that was meeting in person and then during the pandemic going online and then coming back together only now we have a more dispersed group of people around but that conversation between uh online versus in person really got me thinking a lot because i i am i am an introvert and i <laughs> i love the solitude here, here. and i i can even like <laughs> hang with the isolation in some in some respects probably yeah. you know that's the area that i i need to be pushed in but it was actually really interesting the time online was in a way actually really healing for me around some relationships mm -hmm. and and the idea of relationship in general and it kind of expanded and broadened my network of relationships because it was so intentional yeah. and so maybe spiritually or artistically focused. Mm -hmm. And and I didn't have to do all the small talk and the other conversations that go that are that are problematic or difficult for me sometimes. Yes. So it was really interesting. However, at this point, like now I'm really longing, like I want to see those people and I want to hug them and I want, you know, the atmosphere <laughs> and I just want to so I think that what's really interesting about coming together after having not done that for so long is it gives us a chance to ask, what is so special about being in the same room together? You know, what what is it about the atmosphere that makes mm -hmm. this gathering different and how do we take advantage of it and maybe not waste some of that time? Yeah. Like maybe we've been too superficial in some of our encounters with each other and how could we take maybe some of what we learned online and from that solitude and really 
you know, embrace the fact that, oh my gosh, we're in the same room together. <laughs> this, let's right. really celebrate that and not take it for granted. Do you know what I mean? Like, uh, absolutely. No. There. And you're right. And, you know, there is certainly that beauty of the online experience that, that we even got to taste a bit when the lockdown first happened. And I remember, man, one of the most impacting things that I ever saw is there was someone in China who was on their rooftop and we did these online communions together and they couldn't they couldn't go outside they couldn't go anywhere and they just snapped a picture and they put it on um online where we were doing our gathering of them taking communion with us in china from Mm. the top of their building and i'll never forget that it was one of the most beautiful things to see um, that we were, it has given us the ability to connect on such a broader level. Now I'm ready to connect on a deeper level. And, you know, I've said several times, I don't think I coined this. I'd like to take credit for it, but I don't think I coined this. <laughs> I'll give you credit. Uh, yeah. Um, but art is incarnational. Mm. And, you know, there's there's just something of the sensory experience of art that you don't get online, yeah. you know, to be in the same room with someone, to smell the smell, to taste the taste, to to see, to touch, to hear, to feel the bass rumbling off the speakers on your body, you know, yeah. to be able to uh, grab someone's hand and tell them how much their painting impacted you, to be able to see without that filter between you there's something incarnational about that experience that i'm excited to lean into again you know we we haven't done a fully live experience since 2019 so this will be a special time yeah i think i think that's interesting and i and i'm 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 very interested in in that and what you're curious to explore Mm -hmm. in in that gathering and specifically with artists and, and this idea of thinking about the embodied nature of, of things and the incarnational piece, I, I'm feeling very much a sense of wanting to encourage and push forward this conversation around the importance of what the arts are and what art making mm-hmm. really is, that it's it's much more than just something kind of nice that we sort of do, but that that perhaps there is a much more integral role that was intended that God created it for, and that mm-hmm. you know maybe it's time for artists to kind of like shake off some of that stuff and say, yeah. okay, if all this <laughs> stuff matters, if our environment matters, maybe there's a, a spiritual and an important role that that we actually do have to play and it's okay to take up space and Mm -hmm. yes, we need to deal with our humility and all that other good stuff, but so does everybody (laughs) else. And maybe we can let go of that conversation and talk about, you know, what does it look like to be called by God to do this work and take it seriously? Well, you know, I, I think for me, even before I identified, um, as a follower of Jesus, I always had this intimation that the arts were deeply spiritual in nature. I've mm-hmm. just I've just always known and believed and experienced however I defined that or however I labeled that. I've always known that there is a inherent spiritual component to the arts and the more that I go along the more that I realize that you know there are just certain things that cannot be expressed in scientific prose. Yeah. There are just some things that cannot be expressed in a linear interpretation of the experience. You know, there are some things that the only language that can hold the depth of that emotion might be a dance or the only way to give shape to our ideas about the universe is to sculpt it on a wheel, you know, or, you know, and, and the analogy can go on and on, but there, I think that the language of the arts provides a means of understanding spiritual truth that we just don't easily see. And so when you're talking about, um, maybe there's a deeper purpose. That's where my mind goes is that there's just mm-hmm. this other dimension to what it means to be human. It doesn't yeah. have to be super woo woo. Yep. It's just what it means to be human requires that we exercise that language 
And that's for everybody. Some people say, well, I'm not an artist. Right. But you're an appreciator of art and, right. you know, you still have that component inside of you as a human being, whether you make art or whether you respond to it, we're all creative because that's, that's the image, you know? Yeah, exactly. And we're so influenced and shaped by our environments, mm -hmm. especially, you know, and we're responsible for our created environments, you know, our, our human created environments. And there's so much that goes into that. That's, that's a big, a, a big part of, I think what I would love to see move to the front of the conversation. We're not just talking about art in an art museum or going to see a show. We're talking about, you know, the culture, we're talking about everything we swim in all the yes. time and the difference of, are we, in, are we being intentional about that as, yeah, and 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 are a, a particular way of being human, yes. or not? Because it's yes. it's a choice, and you either choose or you choose not to choose, or mm -hmm. you know, as Rush would say, you still have made a choice, right? <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Yeah, the band. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like Rush. <laughs> Ru no, yeah, Rush the band. Sorry. Yeah, Very I'm. Good. I'm actually. Um, I'm. I wanted to kind of push a little bit further into this question of what what you hope or are praying might come out of this gathering of, mm -hmm. of artists at this time. I was thinking earlier when we were talking about, um, or you were saying that it seems like so many people are saying the same things or kind of thinking along the same lines. And I was thinking mm -hmm. about, um, I don't know if you remember, did you watch Battlestar Galactica, the, the series? Yes. And at that point where they're like hearing the song in their head, like the individuals are hearing the song just out of nowhere. And eventually they come together and realize, oh, we're all singing the same song and there's <laughs> over silence. Yeah. But at that point, nothing is ever the same. Everything changes because there's a recognition that there's something bigger than just what's going on in my life that doesn't quite make sense. And it makes sense yes. now that we're together and we have to yes. do something about it. And mm -hmm. I, I'm, you know, I don't want to be too lofty, but I'm just really wondering and praying about whether or not mm -hmm. there might be something brewing that could come out of artists gathering together like this. Absolutely. You know, one of the most beautiful experiences I get to have on the other side of these gatherings is seeing collaborations and friendships form that weren't there prior. Yeah. And I remember years ago we had, you know, our event and, and a lot of people came and then maybe six months later on social media, I saw several different pockets of people creating art together and people who had begun to form these other collectives and things that came out of being together in this event. And I have a good friend of mine, he's actually coming this year, he's teaching a class on filmmaking. And uh, he told me, he's like, Stephen, you know, after the year I came to the breath and the clay, that was the year that gave me the courage to start my own film company. And he ended wow. up leaving his job, he was doing a full-time film editing job for another company. And after that event, he just had that spark to go out and begin this thing. And now years later, he's still making films. Now he's got films in Sundance Film Festival and all these different places that, that wow. came from that gathering. And so when you ask, like, what do you want to come out? What would you like to see? That is one of the greatest joys I have is seeing that creative spark inside of each one of us just get enlarged you know people yeah. just getting the courage and the inspiration and not just inspiration but also a community of people cheering you on and knowing that hey i'm not isolated i'm not in this thing alone and the theme for this year and this might be uh, a good time to bring that up but we have this theme this year that's just simply let there be and of course, that comes from the creation narrative, you know, let there be light. But it's about this calling forth. It's about this giving birth to something new. It's about bringing something into being. And I know a, a large part of it, one of the talks I'm going to give uh, at the Breath in the Clay, it's learning to dream again. Mm -hmm. And I think that for many of us and many of the people that I've talked to in our community, learning to dream again is a tremendous uh, need 
you know, yeah. because so many things were altered or, or shut down or whatever, and courses were changed. And so for me, the idea of let there be is, is really an invitation to bring forth that thing that you've been carrying in your heart that maybe even died and now it needs to be resurrected. But it's just, it's just the permission to re-engage that creative part inside of you that maybe got shut down over the past few years. Yeah. I think that's incredible. Mm -hmm. And I, and I do think there's so much possibility for that. I mean, you think about all kinds of artistic and philosophical movements, which, you know, are, are born out of, of that kind of thing. And that I really do believe that spaces can shape and help us become Mm -hmm. something else. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. it's, that's really amazing. I, I was, thinking about, um, I was really inspired by the book, The Vocation of the Artist, um, written by Deborah Haynes, where she kind of lays out this idea uh, or that her sense is that the call of the artist in the 21st century is to act as prophetic critics and imaginative visionaries. Mm. Um, Just basically acting, creating as if what we make matters and Mm -hmm. how we create matters. And, um, And I do think that that's a big part of what we're called to But you talk about in your podcast, um, you call artists the architects of hope for the next Mm -hmm. generation. And I love that too. I mean, is that what you see the call for artists in the 21st century to be your artists of faith? I I do. I do. You know, and and I I feel like I have to qualify that statement a bit because I don't think that as artists of faith, that that means that everything we create has to be positive right. in the in the sense of you know we also need to grapple with some of the darker parts of our human experience we also need to grapple with some of the the more difficult things and i and i think that that can also be a very important calling but when i talk about the artist of faith being the architect of hope for our generation what i mean is that the framework in which we deal with everything, whether it is the darker parts of humanity or the joy or love or fear or anger or any of these emotions or any of these experiences, hope is the framework that I like to say hope has the final word. Mm -hmm. And I think that because the artist is a bit of, of a prophetic critic and is a bit of a prophetic social critic, I think that especially in our modern time when it seems like things like nihilism uh, Mm -hmm. and hopelessness, um, they're far too normalized. And see, I don't, you know, maybe I've been the tortured artist. Uh, There was at one point in my life (laughs) when I was, I was really afraid of my own healing because Mm -hmm. I thought that if I got healed from some of my own issues, that my creative yeah, you know that that creative angst would go away, but it's just simply not the case. And so I think that the call really is, and the invitation is is the word I like to use mm-hmm. that that we are invi- we are invited by God to be architects of hope. And really, what that means is just that we embrace the worldview um, of what God has to say about human history. And then we live that out through our art, no matter what form that takes. And I think that when people encounter art, hope-infused art, it gives them the ability to make changes in their own life that they didn't know. And if we do that enough, we can change culture. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so much urgency behind, I mean, all you have to do is listen to the news for five five seconds and- Yeah, there's a book um, called The New Leadership Literacies by Bob Johansson that I read right before everything shut down. And he's a futurist. He was talking about the next 10 years. And he was Mm. saying that the biggest indicator of how things will go basically in the next 10 years is young people who are connected and hopeful Mm. versus young people who are connected and hopeless. Wow. Wow. That That's really we are cool. all, you know, it's it, that that what happens there will determine how we go, basically. Yeah. And I think there is just this huge sense of urgency for 
I love this idea of the framework. How do you navigate through the realities of life? Yes. From a perspective of hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And making art. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Absolutely. And I want to mm -hmm. I want to learn how to make art that does resonate across generations. You know, yeah. I, I I want to. I'm thinking uh, in terms of legacy at this point. I'm thinking in terms of like, what are the things that are going to not only shape and transform the people in my life now, but but let's yeah. think a little bit more generationally and, and how can we create works of art that resonate across centuries, you know? Yeah. I love that idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's big. <laughs> it is big. I'm big not there good. yet, but I'm at no, least thinking that way. <laughs> yeah. That's a great, a great call. Well, I, I, um, we are very much looking forward. There's a group of us, a little group of us that are coming to North Carolina, um, to be a part of the breath in the clay and get to meet all kinds of amazing people that I know will be there and to learn and just be engaged. And I, um, I love on, on, I don't know if you do it on all of your podcasts, but I've heard, he heard you say, you know, just, you're not alone. And mm -hmm. And I really appreciate that. And I feel like that's a, an important message. And I feel like this, even this conversation, you know, that, that that's really encouraging that we're, we're not alone in this. And I think that that is probably one of the biggest pieces, like you were kind of saying, of coming together and just being able to connect and know, eh, we're really rooted. We're, yes. we're not alone in this. It's a really, really good, good feeling. That's so good. Well, I'm I'm glad that you guys are coming. I'm excited and I'm also appreciative for you taking the time to talk with me and and ask these questions about the things that mean so much to me. So and mean so much to you as well. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Well, we'll put all of the links and everything in the show notes and um make sure that everybody can get connected with you and sign up and head down to Breath in the Clay in March. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thanks for thanks for talking with us, Stephen. Thanks for having me. Next up on the Be Make Do podcast, we'll continue with the wise hearted ones and look at Bezalel and the prototype of an artist's vocation in Called by Name, Called by Heart. Thanks for listening to this special episode of Be Make Do, a soul makers podcast. Join us and many others for The Breath in the Clay, hosted by Makers and Mystics on Friday, March 22nd through Sunday, March 24th in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, where Lisa will lead the workshop, Curating Wholeness, Building a Purposeful World Through Art. Visit thebreathintheclay.com to reserve your spot. All links and resources for this episode can be found in our show notes.